12, 13,000 uh, new apartments that have been created, there have been something like 11,000 new jobs in that area. 11,000 new jobs. Now, some of them are entry-level jobs. Maybe it's somebody working in a restaurant or retail. But a lot of them are those young, you know, startup entrepreneurs. They're doing production stuff. There are studios there. Um, there are more artists working in Williamsburg than there were um, in, the, uh, in the 1990s. And I think if we have a fact-based discussion about what this kind of mixed-use planning means, that some of the naysayers who just simply don't like change uh, won't have a good ground to stand on. Picking up on the job creation, Aaron, I want to touch base with you. So go back to 2016. You joined Dove Hertz at DH Property Holdings. You're on a mission, and part of that mission is industrial. All right. How much does the, or when you're looking at sites, are you looking at saying, you know, I want to be near the Gowanus because it's sandwiched between some really strong neighborhoods. There's probably going to be a rezoning. It's got the access to Manhattan. What are the drivers for you? And tell us a little bit about the job creation because a lot of the, I think, the people that Ken just spoke about are going to pe be people that are looking for jobs in these um, new industrial hubs. Sure. So. You just asked me six or seven questions. <laughs> um, I'll try to tackle all of them if you I can it. remember. Um, I think, and I'll kind of piggyback off what everyone else has said thus far, we s opened in November of 16. We really focused on industrial because, and I'll keep this brief, there were really no other asset classes that made any bit of sense to focus on when looking at starting a new business with no assets at the time. Um, I think Menachem covered the fear around stabilized residential. I think, frankly, Dove created an oversupply of luxury condominiums, so the luxury residential was kind of out. Although we could still um, use some in Brooklyn. Correct. Um, and we started looking, at, we didn't want to touch hotels, for, that's for another conversation and a different panel. And we started looking at industrial and got to a specific data point, which I think relates back to the rezonings, which is that since I think it's 2002, M-zoned land has been decreased across the boroughs by over 30%, and the city has lost 4,000 acres. Acres, that's an acre is 43,000 square feet, so someone could do the math. But you're talking about a significant amount of land has been rezoned from manufacturing to other districts, specifically Greenpoint, Williamsburg, downtown Brooklyn, Long Island City, and it all made sense. The manufacturing I want to say in Brooklyn alone, we lost somewhere between four and six million. Over thirty, feet. over thirty percent of M zone land in Brooklyn was rezoned since two thousand two. So when you look at that all, I mean, there's a lot of positives around that for all the obvious reasons, and we don't need to get. You know, I think it was covered. But what it did create was, and the reason for it, there was no manu manufacturing was leaving the city. It, ma it made uh, sense at the time, and it probably still does today. Um, but the 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 cost to that was as, you know, I think everybody knows e-commerce, same day delivery, next day delivery, as that went two years ago, we were still in two day delivery, right? And you could see how quickly that's moved in three years. Um, we started looking at the world is shifting towards same or next or same day delivery. Um, e-commerce is growing at 15 to 20% year over year, every year for the last six, seven years. I think e-commerce sales is still less than 15% of total goods being purchased. So you start looking at all this data and you lead to, you can't deliver economically from New Jersey, which historically has been where all logistics has been serviced for New York City, has been from New Jersey. You can't economically, a retailer, a user, a 3PL can't do it economically from New Jersey. They're gonna need to be in the boroughs if we're gonna move towards same and next day delivery. And we started looking and said, the supply's been taken away the existing stock of M-zoned industrial land is all built and the zoning, frankly, is for ma the manufacturing of yesterday, not the distribution of today. Right? You really need a lot of the ability for trucks to access a site easily, not blocking a street. You need interior loading. You need a lot of loading docks. You really can only use space where a truck can access, not, you know, industry city is not industrial. It's amazing what they've done there, but it's not industrial. You only have trucks coming in on the first level, something to do above, right? So when you start looking at all that, there's the existing stock doesn't work, the, the land has been taken away, and there's this demand that's just coming. And we're not ready for it, and it's coming. So we looked at all these data points and said, there's very few sites, and I can get into that data in a minute, but very few sites, and this demand is coming, and let's go. So we've been 
trying to gobble up as much land as we can, and we've only bought three sites because there just isn't a lot of it. Only bought three sites, but how many acres? 24. Not that often we see 24 acres of land trade. Such Correct. Such a short period of time. Anybody has any more? I'm happy to. Sean, can I make a, just a quick point about, about uh, manufacturing itself? Because traditional manufacturing has been hemorrhaging for years, and it's continued to, to do that. What has come out of the new economy is a need for um, uh, sort of high-tech manufacturing, uh, buildings like New Lab in, uh, in uh, the Navy Yard, uh, where they can make a, you know, uh, one microscope can cost a million dollars because they use it to, uh, to look at what computer chips are. Um, we're also at, I think, a point where we're about to find out for uh, some developers and some buildings that um, light industrial in the building is not a concession, it's an amenity. So when, when Toby Moskowitz was developing 25 Kent, it was sort of a concession to the fact that it had been a, 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 an industrial uh, uh, area at some point where they included about 20% of the floor area for, uh, for light industrial. I think what we're going to see in the future is that production companies, designers uh, of all kinds, um, want to have proximity to the most uh, sophisticated 3D printing, uh, laser cutting, and, and the like. There are now uh, places around the country, I visited one in San Francisco that emulates the Greenpoint Manufacturing and Design Center, which is a, a nonprofit here. So one of, and the reason I mention this is that's one of the things we're waiting to see how city planning deals with is what provision they're going to make for light manufacturing and what kind of light manufacturing in the area that's being rezoned residential. Because obviously, it's one thing to have a photographer in the basement, you know, in the bottom of your, your apartment building. It's another thing to have a woodworker with turpentine fumes. We're waiting to see if they've figured that out. So actually, on that point, um, city planning undertook a study of the East Williamsburg area sort of where a lot of this was happening organically. And they have put out a framework to actually encourage um, multi-story light manufacturing buildings. Different from what you guys are doing. I think you are looking for large format and large footprint distribution sites. So I think you know, manufacturing is going in these two different directions. And the third direction where we continue to sort of need more industrial space is for the city's own um, sort of, you know, our sewage treatment plants and our water treatment plants and our salt sheds and all of that kind of stuff. So I think that all of the sort of rezonings that you refer to have brought manufacturing land to a better balance. Because, you know, for the 30 years that, that Ken and I, I think, both saw areas like Greenpoint Williamsburg, there was nothing happening there, and there was no demand. So now at least there, is, there are people you know, looking at manufacturing land with a new lens. I think the issue becomes really of the new manufacturing wants to be in an area that is much more mixed than the former manufacturing was, and then the manufacturing that you are, or the industrial that you are looking at. And I think that is where the challenge is. People still get very worked up when you talk about providing cafes and providing retail and providing amenities, you know, in areas like East Williamsburg. There is still the mindset that an industrial area needs to be purely industrial, otherwise the land values will sort of just skyrocket. But we haven't reached that new equilibrium of thinking about these industrial areas as something that can provide a lot of jobs if they are done right in this mix of air uses. And we've, in, we've encountered a lot of community resistance and political resistance when we've gone out and talked about that at, at, at city planning. Yeah, I, just, I just want to add a couple of points. I think I agree. Um, my concern on the manufacturing side is, economically, does it work for a manufacturing user to pay the rents they'll have to pay to offset the yield a developer is going to need where current construction costs are? I don't think we want to head down that path. But you know, I, I look at the 25 Kent building; it's it's built and it's zero percent occupied, which is scary. But but um, let me give you the other right, example. which is why like 
12 Franklin, which got rezoned to be a similar development, is now on the market for sale. Right? It's, I think people are, I think everybody wants to see it succeed. Um, I think there's that concern currently, hopefully that moves, that you know, uh, can the manufacturing users that you're referring to pay the rents that'll be needed to cover the, right, we're moving back to yield and development and we don't need to go there, but you know, I think that's a concern that hasn't yet kind of been dealt with, and in, right, which I think has to be dealt with. And then I'll just add in the distribution that if New York City wants to remain the class, let's, let's talk about Brooklyn. If Brooklyn wants to remain one of the top five cities in this country, which it is, and it should hopefully always remain, five years from now, everybody's gonna be expecting same day delivery, and we're gonna be at 30% e-commerce, right? Everybody's gonna be buying 30% of their products online. And if we don't have enough distribution space, and we, users aren't gonna be able to provide that. So I think that only focusing on manufacturing space and not looking at distribution space, um, maybe today is not a big deal because everybody's mostly, you know, two-day delivery. Maybe they're doing next day. But if we want to remain a world-class city, it has to be dealt with. Yeah, but can, let me just say, there, there's a lot of office space available in, in Brooklyn, whether it has manufacturing yeah. in, it, in it or not, and the market will observe that over time. But I'll give you a, a different example on the kind of manufacturing that I'm talking about. Um, the Empire Stores, uh, developed by Midtown Equities and HK, one of the reasons why West Elm moved their headquarters into it was because not only could they have terrific views for the designers and talent they wanted to attract, but they actually have an area where they build prototypes and samples, then take it down to their uh, concept store downstairs, test it out, and then decide whether to put it into production. Being able, uh, the same thing, Lexington 148, which is in the Navy Yard, they have their sample shops right next to yeah, Lafayette, right next to where their their uh, their designers and their market people are, because they they believe that that interaction and the avail availability of um, what is really light industrial space immediately adjacent to the rest of their operations uh, makes a difference. And I think what we're going to see in the future is that um, buildings that do that will get a higher rent for the manufacturing than the freestanding manufacturing. They'll get a higher rent for the, for the regular office space than they otherwise would. The problem is it has to be driven by the market and the demand and not, unfortunately, just by government policy. So I agree. I, I just want to jump in because you guys are having all the fun, <laughs> and I respect that. Um, we don't, you know, Hudson primarily is a residential developer, so we don't have a lot. We have no distribution experience. I ordered a bird feeder last night, which I expect will come today from a distribution center, so I benefit from it. Um, but we do, as Sean said, have our first commercial building, and a lot of what you're saying is, is playing out in that building. It's the Breeze. It's in East Williamsburg. Uh, it was an industrial building that held, like, a plumbing supplies firm. There were some moving companies that stored belongings upstairs. Um, and we've transformed it into a commercial office building with retail, really. And the kinds of users that we're seeing and we're leasing to are really um, wide ranging. I think they sort of fit all of the buckets of what you're discussing. We have a design firm that relocated from the Flatiron. They wanted to have be closer to their Brooklyn employees. They wanted to benefit from REAP. They had lots of reasons for coming to us. Um, we have an indoor skateboard park that is going to have sort of like that entertainment aspect to it. We have a bakery that has a wholesale operation. So it's a type of manufacturing. They're manufacturing delicious things to eat. Um, and also they have a retail outlet. Um, we have a very young company that's going to be bottling on site. I can't say who it is yet, but it's very exciting. So they, um, and they're all in the same office building. They're all really excited about the other uses that are there. We have a co-working social club, Ethel's Club, which is um, pr predominantly for people of color. Um, we've got a restaurant, and they all want to be together. They, they think that that's vibrant. They think that's exciting. Um, they want their co-tenancies to be um, things that are different from what they are, and we're next door to a coffee roaster. We're across the street from a props storage firm. We're probably a seven-minute walk from the Netflix new production stages. It's, it's really incredible what's happening in that area, and I think it is showcasing the importance of sort of these mixed use. There's not a lot of residential right in the, the near area, but you know, it's, it's Williamsburg. It's very, very close by. So I, I want to touch on that, Allison, because we have these hubs where we've got innovation from the Brooklyn Army Terminal all around the waterfront and in, into East Williamsburg. And what I've found is it's been hard for renters to be in Park Slope, downtown Brooklyn, 
where you have access to transportation and probably really good access to these hubs. And to that extent, I want to back up probably seven or eight years at a time where my colleague John Berman and I, in different stages of our career, sold Hudson companies some six or 700,000 buildable feet in a market that had really been um, untouched or undiscovered by the multifamily developers that were most active in the Brooklyn market. So what was the impetus for Hudson, other than us being terrific brokers? Well, really, all credit goes to you and to Jonathan. Um, you know, Hudson is a small firm, and we are not, as we like to say, cowboys. Like, we're always sort of looking for what can we afford that's not um, a huge leap of faith. We want to believe that what we're building will appeal to a broad consumer base. Um, and so we're often looking at a subway stop away from every everyone else, um, where the land is a little bit more affordable. And that's what Prospect Lefferts Gardens East Flatbush was at the time that we were um, looking for new opportunities. Um, but moreover, like we're really looking for sites that have all of the good bones that everyone here knows about. We want to be close to transit. We want to be in a vibrant community. We want to have some other thing there. So the other thing here on um, where the park line is at 626 Flatbush, which is where Fenimore dead ends into Flatbush, we have Prospect Park right there. It's amazing. You've got great train lines. And then our other properties um, that are in the area are the corner of Clarkson and Nostrand, which are a block away from the largest hospital like medical complex in New York City. About five million feet. People often don't even realize is there, but it's a tremendous population of people who are coming in and out of there um, every day. We have um, in that particular property, the first phase is completely leased up, and the second phase will start leasing in the spring. And we've seen a lot of people who work or study at that medical complex who are looking for housing. Um, and it's been really interesting since we, we um, started working in the neighborhood um, to see um, the reaction of the people who have been here before we came and the other people. And there were people who were very worried about the change that would come. And there were other people who were very welcoming. But New York City, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but we have a housing problem. And we need housing. Um, and so. I think that there's a lot of people who recognize that that's crucial. I, one, of the, one of the things that Allison and, and David Kramer have done, and, and I'm sure they've thought of it, but, it, but because they're smart folks, is they're tapping into a market for uh, household formation, which is always a major driver of, of economics, but people don't really talk about it. So if you think about those young dot-comers that went to Williamsburg or Dumbo 20 years ago, Many of them have families now. They don't want to live in the wonderful closet-sized buildings where, that are built for singles that you know, ha we have so much of in downtown Brooklyn. They're looking for the two bedrooms, the three bedrooms. They're looking to have an amenity like a park nearby. And so if you just think about the aging of the population and the population that's come to Brooklyn in the last 20 years, building the kind of buildings that they're building in Prospect Lefferts is exactly for that kind of, of, of market. And it's something that I think, um, I think that we have an oversupply of the, of the singles and the studios, and I think we have an undersupply all over the borough for twos, threes, and fours. Well, I love hearing that, because I'm always arguing for more two bedrooms in our projects, but it's true the studios are still renting up fastest. Um, but the other thing that I wanted to mention is that, you know, it, it's been interesting in looking at the, the successful applicants for our buildings and looking at what zip codes they've, they've come from. So when people come to rent an apartment, they have to fill out an application, they write where they're currently living. Um, and the largest sort of concentration of people um, who are moving into our buildings are people from this zip code or the project's adjacent zip code, which was fascinating to me because everyone said, oh, you need to market to the people who want affordability from Manhattan or want affordability from Cobble Hill. We just need like the millennials. And it's really like there's so much pent up demand throughout Brooklyn where people want to have another choice. Um, and whether, and I agree with you that there are people who are sort of going into the next stage of their life and they want to um, have an, you know, an amenitized building that is you know, maybe a little bit more family friendly. But there's also people in, in these neighborhoods who want to have other choices. Um, and there haven't been new buildings in this neighborhood prior to Hudson and now there's a lot um, since like the 1970s. We have this ongoing debate, discussion about creating good paying jobs, creating affordable housing, and avoiding displacement. So I want to touch on three things. We've got the Sunset Park, market, industry city, 
um, the rezoning that's going on in North Bushwick and the rezoning that uh, they're talking about in Crown Heights. Um, are we missing the opportunity um, to create density along the major thoroughfares like Fourth Avenue, like Atlantic Avenue? So for instance, some of the, there has been rezoning applications that were recently approved in the Crown Heights district. The new plan that came out is actually proposing lower density than what city planning has already approved. I recently discussed talking about Fourth Avenue, right? Fourth Avenue was rezoned some 20 years ago, and less than 20 years ago went to R8A. Now it's getting rezoned as part of the Gowanus, it's going to R9. But there's been no talk about going past, I think, 20th Street, where it drops down to R7A. So, Again, are we missing that opportunity? And, and can we be more proactive about it? So I did that rezoning in Sunset Park that mapped the R7A. And it was not for lack of trying. It wasn't a lack of vision. The, the department did go out with an R8A. And um, we did that at the request of the community board at the time. Park Slope had been rezoned. We wanted to continue, it's a 100 foot wide boulevard with subway access right there, and the community and the elected officials just would not go for it. I, they, was, I wasn't trying to they, throw you they, under the bus. No, 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 <laughs> I, no, but what I'm saying is that I think that there is a, you know, as, as Allison has said, there is pent up demand for housing across the board at every income level, other than sort of the high luxury sort of market perhaps. The issue really is, one, making the housing really affordable. I mean, the construction costs are so high in the city that by the time a product comes to the market, it really does not remain so affordable to people. And that makes communities really wary of accepting new development. That is one part of it. Uh, you know, the concern in Sunset Park was that this was going to gentrify the area and you know, the entire sort of um, the Latin American community, the Chinese community, the, all the immigrant communities would be forced out of there. As, you know, Ken has pointed out, those fa fears did not bear out in, in Greenpoint and Williamsburg. I think if we do strategic upzonings in areas that are, you know, not displacing current populations, we can do it right. We have not yet been able to convince the communities that we can do it right. And I think that is the, the second part of that is what you were talking about, is the jobs creation. Because affordability is about people's ability to pay, and that depends on what kind of jobs do they have. With the decline of the old manufacturing, which was sort of the blue collar you know, jobs of the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, the new sort of economy has the potential to create those jobs. Our education system has not woken up to that. We are not training our youth to be able to take those jobs. And I'm not talking about people who are coming out with computer science degrees and engineering degrees and can take the top jobs. A number of jobs in the top tech industry do not require a college degree, but they do require skills. And I think if we can marry those two things and go out in the communities, that's why to me, Gowanus in some ways is exciting that it is recognizing that dual sort of need for, for communities. So while we need sort of the, the, the larger housing for families in, in some of the areas, we also need areas where people can feel, the surrounding communities can feel that their children may be coming out of nature projects, may be coming out of other housing, can be the beneficiaries. So I think that is the missing link, and if we don't get that right, we're gonna to continue to be sort of stymied in our efforts to do more development. Let me, let me pick up on that for a second. First of all, reasonable people can disagree about which parts of the city should accommodate residential. I remember presenting the Sunset Park Industrial Park to Pernama as a mixed-use okay. project, and she told me flat to my face there wasn't going to be any residential in the IBZ, and there probably me. never will be, and then my client sold the, uh, sold the site to, uh, to Dove. Mm -hmm. 
Secondly, I think that, that most people don't really understand that the public process, the public review process, the kind of work that city planning does, and they've gotten a lot better at it over the last few years, it, it, is, it is a real process. We have this cartoon image, developer pours in campaign contributions, and the project comes out at the other end. Um, uh, and, and I don't mean, you know, it, it's just not that way. And, and then we also have the other cartoon, which is you all think that, you know, it, all you have to do is put up a construction fence and all of a sudden the NIMBY crowds are going to be out there with, uh, with uh, pitchforks and, uh, and baby carriages to stop your bulldozers. Um, it's not either of those, but what, what we don't have is a good, uh, we don't have a good narrative, we don't have a good discussion going on here now. I, I can tell you, I went to see a council member um, about a project similar to 25 Kent in a site where city planning thought it was an innovation district to be made and a client that you, you couldn't tell a better story of a, a, a woman-owned firm, immigrant family, very successful. They've owned the land for a while. They were going to build union and hire people from the, the housing projects because they had done that in their own construction business. And when we talked about what that building was going to look like, the office building, light manufacturer, retail, he said to me, I don't believe a single one of my constituents is going to get a, is going to get a job in that building. And, and until we can, we can help educate um, the elected officials about what the realities of those kinds of jobs are, that you don't have to be behind the fence and subsidized by the city to provide the kind of entry level and, and middle class jobs that the Brooklyn Navy Yard does, you know, we're going to have a tough time getting them to understand that the benefits of this are not just for the property owners, but they're for everybody in New York. I'll jump in. Um, you know, one of our sites is on the Red Hook waterfront, right immediately adjacent to Ikea, which I assume everybody's aware where, where I'm referring to, which is down the block from, I think, the or one of the largest NYCHA housing complexes. So we started looking into softly still engaging the community, figuring out the labor needs, et cetera. And what was fascinating to me was the IKEA still 13 plus years later, 15 years after it was built, I think it was built in 05, so 14 years since it was built, they're still 25% of their labor today is from the housing complex. So you know, even on the private development side and a private independent rezoning, it can bear those benefits. It's just sometimes it happens organically, right? And maybe that's an easier way to get it done, I don't know. Um, I can tell you on the distribution side, when you talk about the blue collar, type level labor, uh, we're projecting, just on that one site, we're building a, call it a half a million square foot building, 500,000 square foot building, about 350,000 square feet of warehouse space. We're on a conservative you know, distribution model, labor model, we're projecting about 500 jobs, call it 400 will be you know, above minimum wage, not $15 an hour, above that, not you know, $100,000 a year jobs, but really good paying jobs for a lot of the local residents that they'll be, I th we think, very interested in. And you have to engage the right, mm -hmm. you know, there's the South, Southwest Brooklyn Industrial, you know, um, Ben Margolis, I forget what he calls the company, right? Yeah, exactly, right? So you engage him, that Red Hook has their, own, um, has their own group that you can engage with and talk to, and we're working on training, you know, job training programs. There are ways, I think, where it can happen maybe outside of uh, rezoning, that can happen organically, and sometimes if you build it, they will come, right? Not to sound too cheesy, but um, right, that exists. And I just, to go back on some of the residential discussion, I think I want to tie in a lot of what was mentioned, right? The, the one thing that I think can cause a lot of pause on some of this kind of affordable development around rezonings, besides the construction costs, are the new rent laws. So right, there is a lot of demand for two- and three-bedroom apartments, which is great. Um, you know, we've looked at a couple of new residential developments under the 421A, and I think the problem, and is putting a lot of fear in a lot of developers right now, is that if you're starting rent, right, you get the 70-30, right, everything's great, but if you're starting rent on your 70% free market units are not above 2,700, then they become subject to stabilization. So you have a lot of sites that are great development sites that are near transit, in a lot of areas that could use development, that are already zoned for development. But if your one bedrooms and your studios are gonna be below $2,700, so you're not building a 70-30 project, you're building a, let's say 50 or 100, right? So you're only, you can only build it if you can build two and three bedrooms only, which doesn't help the community because there's not that large of a demand and you can't make the, 
the footprint of the building work. So I think that putting these rezonings through in great locations is, is, is a need. There's a demand for it. We need more affordable and market rate at you know, housing and at good price points for a lot of people. But if, if there are other laws outside of the specific rezonings that are, I think, potentially causing the pause, um, which I don't know how we get around. Way to transition to one of the hot topics, um, the Housing Stability and Tenant Protection Act. Um, we sell a lot of multifamily, um, a lot of multifamily buildings throughout the city, and you know, we I hear something different every day. Sometimes I hear that um, the uh, the tenant advocacy groups um, were pushing pushing really hard. We know that they pushed hard. The other end of it is you hear that the landlords didn't necessarily show up in Albany. And we're hoping that Cuomo is gonna come to their rescue. I know a pretty smart guy who thought that uh, he might. Um, Ken, what do you, um, you know, what's your take on really what went down between the two parties? Um, so the, the tenants had an air game and a ground game, and the real estate industry was focused on sort of making fact-based arguments directly to the decision makers, but they they got caught short. They got surprised by the politics. Um, there was a lot of pent-up resentment against uh, against uh, the real estate industry for having kept the Republicans in control of the state senate for so long. And when the Democrats took control, um, they didn't have as many friends there as they thought they did. But I also think that um, they uh, the tenants. Because I saw this with, I represent some multifamily folks who get into these kinds of messes. They had a very well laid out campaign for a whole year before the laws came up for renewal, where they would pick some landlord who had done some transgression, legal or not, but something that they could they could claim was too aggressive. So there would be um, there would be the, the the advocates would issue a report. Uh, some lawyer would sue. Some government person would uh, would open an investigation. Somebody else would have a, a press conference, and they did it all over the city on a timed basis. So they created this impression that this type of uh, aggressive tactics was happening all over in, all over New York. When the fact of the matter was that that it wasn't. Um, the industry, I, I have to say, respectfully played into that to some extent because um, real estate uh, multifamily used to be a long-term hold. You, you bought it for the cash flow, the depreciation, and to be able to refinance it, and it was a generational play. And then about 20 years ago, um, it became a commodity. It, you, people were day trading in, uh, in, uh, in, in apartment buildings, and they were doing it with five-year money. So when we had a liquidity crisis, um, they dried up. And, and once again today, think of what's happened in Albany with the legislation as a new form of a liquidity uh, crisis. And what you're gonna see over time, it's not gonna be a disaster overnight. It's gonna take 10 years for it to be a crisis, and then it's gonna take another 10 years for the politicians to, to, to fix it. But what you're gonna see is a, is a readjustment in land prices. That's ultimately what it turns out to be. And a lot of people are gonna get hurt by it, and a lot of tenants are not gonna get the service that they, uh, that they deserve and that they need. What you do about it is a more complicated question. And I can tell you that there are lots of folks that are talking to me about um, finding new ways to communicate um, and to bring the facts. How much is it gonna cause? Anybody here had to replace their elevators because, because it was, they were too old to put a lock on it, right? 40,000 elevators in the, in the city needed to have new locks put on. If they were built pre-war, you had to replace the entire elevator. Think of the small owner who has to go out and convince their bank now to, to finance something like that. You're gonna see a lot of properties going back to the banks, maybe back to the city for, uh, for taxes. Hold, hold on one second there, yeah. Real quick, how many people own apartment buildings in Brooklyn? Yeah. How many people own apartment buildings that are less than 12 units? So Brooklyn alone has 21,400 apartment buildings. 14,000 of those buildings are between six and 12 units. 50% of those buildings are owned by people who own two or three buildings, and the other half, 7,000 of them are owned by people who own one building. And what we're hearing from a lot of our concerns, these people have owned these buildings for 30, 40 years, 20 years. 
They worked as cops or firemen. Um, they worked 20 hour days. They went and they renovated an apartment when it became vacant. And now you're asking somebody who owns a building that's worth a million and a half, two million dollars to invest $15,000 and get back a 1% return over the duration of which you can recapture that uh, through the improvements. So, so let me ask one question, Sean, which will help answer your question. Okay. So for all of you who own multifamily, how many of you called your state legislator, wrote a letter, or went to Albany? Anybody? Anybody in this room? Okay. Well, they're coming back in the next session with just cause eviction and a whole bunch of other pieces of legislation. And um, if you don't want that kind of legislation passed, a year from now, you all better be able to raise your hand. I'm just curious, how many of you think the value of your property has been reduced dramatically over the last six months? And I'm, one other question, I'm just curious, how do you think the city makes up the loss of transfer tax revenue, the loss of mortgage recording tax revenue, and offsets as budget increases go up based on the current RPIE system of, of figuring out values as NOI effectively drops? How does the city make up for the, its inability to increase its taxes on properties? Does it just increase the, the rate and keep values low? Like, how does the city handle what I believe they just cause themselves a significant moving loss of income moving forward? I think Ken hit it on the head. It's going to take 10 years for them to figure out and the next 10 for them to fix it. I mean, based on, uh, I read from you guys, the, the way the percentage drop of properties being sold over the last couple of months, I think it's going to be a lot less than 10 years until they realize, I mean, they're just not, the money's going to dry up pretty quick. Yeah, well, one more question. How many of you voted for term limits? Yeah, everybody thought it was a good idea to get rid of all the politicians. Now none of the people in office today in, in City Hall are going to be here long enough to feel the effects of what's going on. Allison, you're, at, at Hudson, you own a lot of this product, right? A lot of rent-stabilized product and some preservation. Yeah, I mean, we have um, a wide variety of housing types in our portfolio. Um, we don't, we've not, we're more of generational type holders um, and we've never had the business plan of buying and turning. That's just not what the business that we want to be in. Um, and so I think for us, it's not as much of, a, it's not the same bottom falling out as it is for some um, people who had that business strategy. And also we are a little bit bigger and probably a better able to weather the storms than some of the people that you're talking about who maybe this is their entire retirement plan was to own this you know, small unit building. So um, there's a lot that remains to be seen. I, I mean, I've had um, equity investors who were very excited to jump in both feet um, in the beginning of 2019 who are now waiting for something exactly what I'm not sure to happen before they're ready to come back. And that makes me very nervous um, because I am a housing developer in New York City and this is what I want to be doing and this is what I think we need for our city to be a, continue to be a great city, to be able to house people, it's the affordability crisis and all of these things um, interact in a way that I think is um, makes us all nervous and it should make us all nervous for a wide variety of reasons, whether it's because it's your business or because it's the city you live in and you want it to be economically strong. Um, but I also think that like there's a lot that remains to be seen. You know, I think um, there's Rent Guidelines Board, there's the city and their various um, property tax programs. You know, I think we've probably all heard Louis Carroll say they're looking at J51, they're looking at different things. And so a little bit of time to figure out what's happening, um, although it's not great now, I think is an, is an okay thing for a lot of us. Maybe not everyone is in the position to be able to say that, but. How do you think it impacts land prices, right? We've had some clients who are residential developers or who are in the business of, you know, partnering with five-year money um, and turning over units who basically think it's going to create a lot of um, pressure on, uh, a lot of pressure on rents um, and that it's going to drive land prices even higher. I, I don't, I'm not sure if I understand the argument for driving land prices higher, honestly. I would think that they would go 
lower, and that would be kind of okay with me. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that is the point. I think that there, you know, to Ken's point earlier, it was the commodification of sort of this product that made the pendulum sort of swing in a way that is not helpful to anyone. But some amount of land price adjustment was necessary. We were sort of entering this market where it was becoming really sort of a, a, a ridiculous game. And that's not what housing needs to be. And it may have been a few bad actors, but they were, there were some significant projects where this was starting to happen. And that really, you know, I think Ken is right that the property owners were taken aback by the speed with which this happened. But if you were listening to the communities, this had been simmering for the last two decades. There's one other thing, and it, I won't call it good news, but it's, it's, it's not bad news. Um, and that is for a lot of the multifamily in Brooklyn, your typical six, eight story building, Ocean Parkway, Bensonhurst, uh, even in big parts of, of Crown Heights, um, the stabilized rents and the market rents are about the same, mm -hmm. right? So you could go into that building and you could put a million dollars into it and be able to raise the rent whatever you wanted, but the market wasn't gonna change more than $25, $50. And I think the overwhelming majority of the housing stock in, in Brooklyn falls into that category. Where the political clashes happened were the neighborhoods in transition, where you know this neighborhood, as I said, I grew up nearby, and this is the you know the, my the building that I lived in first on Butler Place and, and which became a condo and and um, Grand Army Plaza which became a uh, uh, also a condo. Um, it's neighborhoods like this that are changing. The demographics are changing. My daughter now lives in Crown Heights, the neighborhood my family left 64 years ago. Um, those are the areas where people saw the change. They saw the bodega turn into a Starbucks. They saw their neighbors move out. Um, even if their neighbors were moving to North Carolina with the fortune that they made when the building was converted. Um, but the, the overwhelming majority of the housing stock is not in those neighborhoods. Uh, the population growth keeps going. Um, the, the wave of development you know, cascades off the East River. Um, but for the most of the buildings in, in Brooklyn, I think you're not going to see those kind of dramatic changes, with the exception of the smaller buildings that, that you pointed out, because you know, those are the ones that really can't afford to take the hit. Let's uh, switch gears for a second. Um, this is uh, kind of a group therapy session on this, um, uh, on this topic. I want to go back to um, the office market for a second. Um, we have a huge innovation tech growth um, movement in Brooklyn. Again, wrapping around the waterfront. Um, I'm wondering if um, any of our panelists would like to predict the next big tenant that takes 100,000 feet in the Brooklyn office market. Allison, you're seeing a lot of these types of tenants come I mean, through. My, our, the tenants that we're seeing are uh, smaller than 100,000 square feet, which would be our entire building. Um, but I'm wondering um, maybe about like even something like as large as a Google. Like Google is expanding everywhere. I have a good friend who um, is now in charge of sort of the region around Denver and she told me that one of the cities she goes to is Bismarck. Like I wouldn't have thought that Google has office space in, in Bismarck, South Dakota, but they do. So they're really literally everywhere. Um, and so I think that they probably need a big office in Brooklyn. Those kinds of tenants, the big national companies, are looking for um, regional transportation options. And unfortunately, the Brooklyn office market is not well positioned. It can't compete with Manhattan. It's hard to get here from Westchester or from New Jersey. Uh, Long Island Railroad, when, when it's improved, will make it easier for Long Island. But if you're, a, if you're drawing on talent from a regional area for a major corporation, it's still going to be a tough sell. But where I do think that the big tenants are going to come for, from over time is there was a point when Brooklyn was a headquarters city, when it was Brooklyn Union Gas and not National Grid, when it was independent savings bank and not you know, an international conglomerate. In those days, we even had our own Polytechnic Institute, not NYU. Well, we're starting to be a headquarters city again. There's a reason why Etsy is in, uh, is in, is in Dumbo, because the founder 
um, was from Brooklyn. And as we see those startups turn into bigger and bigger companies, they're going to become the 100,000 square foot uh, tenant of, of the future. And that's why we need live, work, play, stay places so that we can encourage those folks to come here, create their businesses here, create jobs here, and make their headquarters here and provide employment for our neighbors. I think the office market in Brooklyn has thrived where there are existing loft buildings that have been able to convert, whether that is uh, you know, Dumbo, Greenpoint Williamsburg, East Williamsburg, other areas. New commercial office buildings, ground up, rarely pencil out. And that has been a problem. Even in downtown Brooklyn, we haven't seen all commercial buildings yet other than the ones that are subsidized by the city. Now, Toby did put up her building at 25 Kent, and we will see how that does. But it has been hard to get the rents that are necessary. Even the Googles of this world are going into the Chelsea market, the you know, St. John's terminal, buildings that are already there that can be renovated and that can be occupied. I mean, we saw the whole Amazon sort of disaster. That could have sort of created a framework in which you could see new commercial development in a mix of uses. And I think that is a sort of a, a not a building construction, but really sort of a look at an area-wide growth or a larger growth that can accommodate that in a mix of uses. I am also bearish on the Brooklyn office market. I worked on two office buildings prior to being at DH Property Holdings. I put WeWork in 109 South 5th in South Williamsburg, and we had 50 small tenants, that 500 square feet each, that you know, were relocated due to that. So I, I kind of saw a little more of the local 500, 1,500 square foot users, and there are a lot of them in Brooklyn, and there'll, I think, always be that demand for them. Um, I also worked on 57 Willoughby, which is pretty close by in downtown Brooklyn, um, which also had a lot of kind of local or nonprofit, not this kind of major 100,000 square foot user. I think Ken hit it on the head. I think that when you look at Manhattan between access with Port Authority, Penn Station, you know, Metro North, Grand Central, and all the subways coming in from all the boroughs and Long Island Railroad, it's really hard when you're thinking about how to compete for labor hiring to bring your office to Brooklyn for that reason. Brooklyn's amazing. It's the fourth largest city in the war in the country, um, but you have Manhattan right across the river, which makes it really challenging. And you know, I look at all of the products getting delivered in Brooklyn, right between the stuff going on in Williamsburg with Two Trees, um, with Toby's building. There's a lot of stuff coming online in downtown Brooklyn, um, and if it's really hard, that's a lot, and Industry City's done an incredible job, and that's what we were talking about earlier, of mixing office space and some light manufacturing. They have another three million feet to fill up. There's a lot, a lot, a lot of office supply. A lot of guys bought old industrial buildings and converted it for that creative office use. That was the big buzzword three years ago. There's probably a panel about creative office you know, in this room three years ago. It hasn't really panned out for that many developers and operators. And there's, I think, always going to be demand for office space in Brooklyn, but the question is, is that ever larger than a 10 to 15,000 square foot user on the whole, right? I think that 100,000 square foot user is probably 99 out of 100 times still gonna go to Manhattan based on the regional transportation. Yeah, and by the way, in terms of our own regional, local regional transportation, if you will, I wanna put in a plug for the BQX to be able to get in minutes from Sunset Park up to Astoria to go through, you know, uh, Dumbo and, and Wallabout and Williamsburg, the Creative Crescent, the generators of jobs in Brooklyn. Um, we need that. We need that. And we need all of you to speak up and say that because that transportation spine is what's going to make that whole corridor uh, into one economic development engine. The other area that I would say that actually already has some of the infrastructure in place is the Atlantic Avenue corridor. I think you started out with yeah. that. And I think that is a real underutilized um, sort of um, you know, opportunity right from Brooklyn Heights 
to um, East New York and beyond to, to the airports. And you know, we did the East New York work, which was sort of recognizing that at that end and trying to tell people that an area like East New York is transit rich. Don't just think of it as something that cannot take a, a, a good amount of mixed use development, but I think the areas in between running through you know, Crown Heights running through um, some of Brownsville and all of that entire corridor, if the Long Island Railroad um, improvements go through, and especially if we can convince um, um, Long Island Railroad and MTA to make, you know, the, the $2.75 uh, fare stick there, this is a tremendous opportunity where the infrastructure is in place. It's a 100-foot wide road, and there is no reason that it should not be more vibrant than it is. And, and to that point, you faced a lot of pushback, I believe, from the constituents in the East New York market when, um, when that rezoning uh, plan was released. What was, is the, were the arguments against the rezoning, were they based in logic? Is it emotion, a little mix of both? And how did you eventually get that you know, over the hump? <laughs> so that was the first neighborhood rezoning we did once um, mandatory inclusionary housing was in place. The work for that actually predated this administration. That was while I was running the Brooklyn office that we got a grant from the federal government to study East New York as a sustainable community because of the Long Island Railroad access. There was a regional access point there. I think a lot of the concern um, once MIH was adopted was really that somehow, you know, mapping an area with a requirement for 30% affordability meant we would have 70% luxury housing in, in East New York. I mean, it was not based in any kind of fact, but there was a lot of raw emotion that had come up through this process. Now, since then, you know, Everything that has happened there is exactly what the city said would happen. There is a new school that has broken ground. There, is, there are two affordable housing projects that were the big ones that are happening. Um, the park at City Line has been uh, improved and now is a skate park that is on the national websites for skaters. There is the uh, PAL facility, that's an after-school facility now that has just been inaugurated. So I think there was a lot of fear. Where we have not yet seen movement is again in the office sector. So EDC has been trying to market a site very close to Broadway Junction for new office users, and the idea was to see if we could move some of the city offices from downtown Brooklyn there or other offices and sort of open up this space to the market, to and, the- And those, uh, those kind of public-private partnerships have really proven to be successful, and we saw it in, they in downtown they Brooklyn. And what we also saw in downtown Brooklyn is that they take time. It doesn't happen overnight, you know, so. Um, in your packets is a map that um, our office put together to try and identify where government was putting its thumb on the scale for, for better uh, in many cases uh, and not. So what we mapped was the then study areas where city planning, like Sunset Park, uh, and that uh, Iguanas was, was getting ready to maybe do a rezoning, landmark districts where you can't really build, IBZs where you can't do residential, but we also mapped the parks, the subway stations, the ferry stops, the new transportation that's no longer all about the subways, uh, the BQX, we put it all on one map. All of those are government incentives, constraints, and infrastructure investments that government is doing because the private sector can't do it themselves. And if you look at that map, you'll see how the market has been responding in terms of the development, where it's happening, where it's not happening, uh, and maybe because it's for good reason, uh, it, because we don't have the, the parks or the transportation there. So it's all on one map uh, in your packages, and I hope it'll help you go find where the next hot neighborhoods are going to be. So Aaron, we have this wide thoroughfare on Atlantic Avenue. Is DH looking in the East New York market, that end of Brooklyn, or staying closer to the Manhattan side? 
So I'll just wear my distribution hat. I think that's what you're asking about, not the other stuff we're looking at. So we have been focused on the waterfront in that area for two reasons. Um, it's really proximity to the consumer, mm -hmm. right? When you're thinking about same-day delivery and e-commerce quick, it's all about moving product quickly to the consumer. So you want to be as close to the densest of populations as possible and populations with right, high disposable income who are historically, buy, or at least right now, buying more online, um, right? We're building speculatively, so we're thinking what the tenant's going to be thinking, right? So we're looking to be as close to the consumer as possible, right? So if you look at Red Hook and Sunset Park, you're seven minutes into Lower Manhattan, you're 20 minutes to Williamsburg, you're 40 minutes to Long Island City, and you're near Park Slope, Cobble Hill, Carroll Gardens, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's one piece. The other piece of it is that you can't take a commercial vehicle on the Belt Parkway, and you can on the BQE. So East New York is accessed by the belt. Uh, you can't bring a commercial vehicle on the belt. So from a distribution standpoint, going to East New York, looking at it for a same day delivery distribution into the boroughs, I think is a challenge. I think East New York is really close, or not really close, but close enough to JFK, which is a different industrial market on its own. It's an air cargo play, not a you know, same day delivery play. Um, that market also is at 2% vacancy, um, and I think East New York, and there's some industrial developments happening there, mm -hmm. right? and I think that will continue, but I think it'll be more users looking um, for their JFK needs than their you know, last mile deliveries to Park Slope. Um, so look, we've had a really good discussion here today. Uh, I'd like to open up the um, forum for questions. Uh, from the audience. Anybody have any questions for our panelists? I'm sorry, your name is? Um, it specific, sorry, I, she mentioned new economy jobs that don't require college degrees, particularly with the advancements in AI and the automation of uh, repetitive tasks and things like that. Could you be more specific? What, what jobs in particular are you referring to? So um, the, um, there was a study that uh, Downtown Brooklyn Partnership did with um, Dumbo and Brooklyn Navy Yard called the Tech Triangle Study. Uh, there's a lot of research that has been done on this. That study lays this out. A lot of the jobs, when you look at a tech company, are not really doing the software development, but really sort of being skilled enough in computers to be able to do the delivery stuff, to be able to do logistics, to be able to do stuff that supports the high-tech kind of um, the, the brain-heavy jobs, if you will, or, or the AI-heavy jobs. And um, the data I have seen suggests that, you know, something in the range of half of those jobs do not require a college degree. And they pay pretty well. And I think this is the argument that Amazon was making in, in um, Long Island City when they were coming, that they were promising these average, whatever, 100,000 jobs, uh, uh, 100,000 salary per job, because, precisely because there is a whole bunch of these jobs that may not pay 100000 but will easily pay sixty, eighty thousand dollars $80,000, which is pretty livable compared to what else is happening. So I just, I just listened to a great podcast I recommend, Land of the Giants on Amazon, um, and they actually interviewed one of the local employees in the new Staten Island facility, right? Amazon took about a million footer in Staten Island, um, where the NASCAR was going to go, um, and this... 25-year-old, you know, kid said, I couldn't get through, he was interviewed, couldn't get through college, wasn't for him for a whole number of reasons, took a job there as a packing boxes, and within six months, he's now overseeing a section of the warehouse, and, and he was talking about how many jobs it's created locally, and specifically these types of jobs, and how quickly, you know, they're climbing into better jobs. And the average job, if I remember correctly, in that facility is about $60,000. So, and this is a distribution facility. So if you think of something that is more um, of sort of the light manufacturing kind of job, there are a lot of jobs. I think that the issue really is that they may not require a college degree, but they require skills. 
and many of our youth that are not going to college and are coming out of our public schools here just are not given those skills. So, you know, in some ways the community colleges need to wake up and sort of fill this new gap, which many places, LaGuardia uh, in, in Long Island City is starting to do a lot of that, so. I'll follow up with my second question for Ken. Um, not to sound cynical, I don't own multi multifamily in, in Brooklyn, but I did call my state representative prior to the enactment of the laws and I effectively got laughed at. Uh, how do you respond to that? Um, early to rise, early to bed, and organize. You know, fight like hell. Um, there just weren't enough of you. There, there just weren't enough of you, and, and I think the industry waited until the last minute. So were they putting on the blitz? You know, if you, I'm sure that if you went up to Albany and listened to the radio, you would have heard commercials about this. That I got one, one piece of mail, maybe two, I think I got one piece of mail on this, but it was, it was too late by the time it was set. So what I'm saying is, is it, you can change the narrative. There is an anti-Amazon anti backlash. We, we, you all see, every time you go out to any kind of meeting and talk to people, any kind of event, that's all that people in the community that are, are talking about, that will get organized. It has to get organized, and they have to, to start on it sooner the city council is gonna turn over, two-thirds of the city council is gone in 2001, together with the mayor, the borough presidents, and the other officials. Um, if folks are not involved in the process, you're going to get a, city, a new city council that's even more progressive um, than what we have now. So you just can't assume that somebody else is, is gonna do it, and you know, you're to be applauded for having made that call. But if every hand in the room had gone up, I can assure you it would be a different outcome. The other thing I will point out is that whenever some of these big projects are publicly discussed, a lot of the opposition in the last sort of decade or, or so has become sort of this professional troop of people who are going from one area to the other opposing the projects. So a lot of the opposition in Amazon, if you speak to people who actually live and work there, was not local. In fact, the head of the NYCHA Housing Tenants Association there has written you know, op-eds uh, sort of criticizing people who came in and did not allow her community to be able to get the jobs that they all felt they could get with the Amazon. So that's the other thing. It has become sort of almost like a, a you know, a, 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 I don't even know what the right term is, but it's the same group of people who are going everywhere, opposing everything without sort of um, uh, any logic or without any local input. I'd, I'd call it the vocal minority. Who, I mean, I think there was a study done recently, right? Over 80% of tweets are sent by less than 10% of Twitter accounts. Right, it, it's, I think it's uh, larger than a rezoning you know, New York City issue. It's probably a, certainly a yeah. national issue of where social media has taken the world, right? It's the minority can, if they know how to you know, manipulate. manipulate and take advantage of social media, it, it, it's allowed that to happen. I just want to, can I, am I allowed to ask a question? Yeah. I want to ask Ken a question. Uh, there are a lot of murmurings that I'm hearing, and I'm curious if you're hearing it and where you think this goes, of free market legislation being passed in the next five years on free market space around evictions and around being able to, you know, not being able to raise rent to whatever number you want in a free market area. Are you hearing the same things? Do you think that passes and how does that impact, you know, the multifamily sector in general? So uh, let me just say first, um, you can make convincing arguments, and when you do it the right way, engage with the community and have something positive to say, you can win. And I would give you as Exhibit A, our friends at the Hudson Company, who got the Brooklyn Heights Association to support their new building, sitting on top of a new branch of the public library in Brooklyn Heights. I don't think the BHA had supported any development since uh, it was the creation of the promenade in the 1950s, which they don't want touched. But the, the community, yeah, were there, were there noisy people out there who were objecting and, and fighting it? But at the end of the day, the community saw the merits of, of, of what Hudson was proposing and, and will reap the benefits of it. So it, it can be done. And if I could just say one quick thing about that. It's 
part of it, I think, is not making it so oppositional. Like, we really come to a place, and, and I think this happens cyclically in New York City in real estate over time, and it's happening in our country at a large level, where it's just us versus them. Um, and it doesn't need to be us versus them. So when, when people, when we're doing a development in a neighborhood, people call me and say, like, we're upset about this, and we want you to come to our meeting, I go, and they're always like, I can't believe you actually showed up. I'm like, well, we're gonna be neighbors for a long time, so let's sit down and have a conversation. I have, and it, it takes like an hour of my time to sit down and hear from people. Um, and there can be tweaks sometimes to plans. There can be things you can change. There's things you can't change. Sometimes you say no a lot. You don't agree. They still sue you. There's a lot of different outcomes. <laughs> um, but the point is, like, it doesn't. I think that you get farther when you're like, what, what is, what can we find together? What common ground can we find? Um, and I think that that goes a little bit back to what you were saying earlier about sort of the hearts and minds. You know, there are a lot of. Um, these small building owners who are going to be greatly impacted by the rent stabilization laws. And like when I, so I'm a member of the Park Slope Parents Listserv and like every day there's a question from someone about like, my landlord does this, are they allowed to do that? Um, and I think that there's just, it's just this big gulf between us where if we can say like, well, your land, like you live in a, a you know, a 10 unit building and your landlord, you know, did X, Y, Z that you didn't like, but do you understand sort of like, why and the, the rationale and all of this, like we can really build bridges rather than it just being like, you're wrong, we're right, uh, we're, you're the little guy, we're the big guy. Like, but to answer your question specifically, and I think Menachem mentioned it, it the concept is called uh, just cause eviction. It, it really means just keep the tenant where they are and just keep Menachem fully employed. Um, what it, what it, it's got it's got two it's got two components to it. One is um, that. It basically raises the bar for being able to, to push out an obnoxious uh, 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 tenant. Um, uh, but the other thing, the economic piece of it, which they don't really talk about, is that it would cap uh, market rent increases at a percentage over inflation. Um, in some jurisdictions where they've actually adopted it, it's been like five points above eviction, um, uh, five points above inflation. So let's say, say the inflation rate is 3%. Um, even if your building was a mess, you fixed it up, you treated people the right way, and it's in a neighborhood now where you can command significantly higher rents, the only amount you'd be able to raise rents would be uh, in that uh, limited range. Um, it's been proposed by one of the state senators who beat an incumbent Democrat who voted with the Republicans. And if you think that her colleagues didn't notice that, um, I can assure you that they did. So as long as the political dynamic is favoring uh, the progressives, you will see them importing ideas from all over the country. I think there's gonna be pushback from that. The leadership of the state legislature, the speaker um, in the, uh, of the assembly, uh, Carl Hasty, uh, his counterpart in the state senate, uh, Andrea Stewart-Cousins, um, they are very thoughtful, moderate folks but they are only leaders because they have followers. And the minute they stop following their followers, they're not the leaders anymore. So they needed to be armed with the political uh, ammunition that they need to push back on the policies that are crippling and irrational, uh, at the same time being mindful of the things that, that do have to be reformed. So when you get an email from a contemporary, a fellow investor, owner, asking to support a particular politician on a particular cause, uh, probably worthwhile to show up at uh, that event or at least make a contribution. I think we have time for one more question. Anybody else? Thank you. Uh, this question is for Aaron. Uh, I'm Ritu. Uh, we are architects. I own an architectural firm in Manhattan. We, like all other architects, are doing work in Brooklyn and Queens. Uh, we are primarily in the one to four family space, but we also have a few blimps in our portfolio, one being industrial facilities. So we did work for what was formerly the Bulova Warehouse on BQE. We put the two parcels together, which is now currently a four acre lot which was sold to Toronto and being leased by Amazon. So my question to you is, you said BQE is not open to truck traffic. Why on earth would Amazon lease this space if that's the case? Sure. So I said the belt was enough. Belt, not but the BQE. not BQE. Yeah, yeah. So I saw that deal. I should have bought it before Torino. I regret yeah. it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I knew Amazon was coming. Um, but the BQE can have commercial vehicles. It's the belt that can't. 
Okay, I was uh, trying to gather some information which would give us a heads up on other industrial <laughs> facilities, but I guess that's not happening. Thank you. So I just want to thank our panelists uh, for a great discussion. I think the future of Brooklyn looks bright. Obviously, there's some, um, some, uh, some clouds in the sky for the immediate forecast. But I think overall, long term, uh, with professionals like we have here influencing the evolution of uh, the Brooklyn market, I think we're in good hands. So thank you, everybody, for coming. And thank you to our panelists.